I, I've seen some different numbers. Uh, you said 60 tons. I, I've seen uh, up to 50 cannons. Is that correct? Or right. how many cannons do they uh, haul? 59. 59 cannons. 59. Okay. Okay, so they have 59 cannons on sleds. Are these sleds essentially wood pallets? And what is it like pushing this along? Is it constantly getting stuck? Is it moving along pretty well? Can you just paint this scene for me? Absolutely. Well, first of all, he's got to get there. So he goes all the way up to Fort George, and now he's got to get across Lake George to Fort Ticonderoga, which is up on a river between Lake Champlain and Lake George. Now, the lake's frozen, right, except for a middle passage. So, you know, in early December, they head off through the middle lake with all these boats. So now they've got to get this 60 tons, 120,000 pounds of cannons out of Fort Ticonderoga, down into these boats, right, put them in the boats, and these are, you know, all sorts of different kinds of boats to do this. And some of these cannons weigh 5,000 pounds. So they, they, you know, they load up all these, these boats, and now they've got to go down Lake George. This is even before the oxen and sleds, and get back to Fort George. Well, what happens? Of course, the weather. The lake is freezing, it starts, the wind starts to blow, they can barely make it, and it becomes a 10-day journey of hell, trying to get across Lake George in the dead of winter, pushing through ice, they're freezing, boats are sinking, you know, these are, you know, thousands of pounds of iron going down the bottom, but here's the thing, they can't leave anything, they need every cannon, and so they keep, you know, having to stop, pull them back up, and these incredible operations, put them back in the boat, and go on. And it takes 10 days just to reach, you know, the Fort George, where there, right, there, they finally can transfer them into oxen and sleds. Now, there's a lot of problem getting the sleds and oxen, and that's a whole story into itself, because the people are supposed to supply them, then supply them, Knox had to go down and negotiate and get them brought up. But they finally get them, and so then they load these things up, and they're basically big wooden sleds and and they're pulled by oxen and horses and so they create five groups of of sort of packets of sleds soldiers oxen horses and they push off now how does this happen how, what's the actual physicality of this well they use teamsters a guy named jim becker is heading them up and these teamsters basically move freight that's what they do so these guys are having to use pulleys and ropes and anything they can do to move this along. Why? Because snow is a problem. There is no snow for a while. And so they're basically leaving in mud and ice. And then when the snow comes, it gets too deep. So as they're moving along, the sleds would suddenly turn over. And that would happen because they'd be on a narrow trail. And, and the weight was shifting, and the oxen would go the wrong way, and so you'd have a rollover. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. So then you have to roll the sled back over. They have to stop, wrap these pulleys around trees, and pull these back over. So this is basically moving these by brute strength. You know, trying to move what today we would use, you know, semis for. Um, but they're using oxen, men, and sleds. In, and we call them on roads. They weren't even roads. They were sort of a widened trading paths. So as they're going, you know, they're just having these rollovers, they're having problems. And, and of course, then they hit, you know, winter storms. And many times, you know, it seemed like they couldn't go any further. So, you know, this is really a titanic task. And now, of course, we get to the rivers. Now, they got across the Hudson four times, which, you know, it, it's in various points of freezing. Some places it's frozen. Some places it's not quite frozen. And Henry Knox, you know, they basically cross these rivers with a teamster, Henry Knox ahead. All right, let's take the 5,000-pound uh, uh, cannons. So they would leave with that because that's the heaviest one. And a, a teamster would walk alongside with an axe ready to cut the ropes if the cannon broke through the ice. And it did. 
it, it happens several times where they're walking along. Suddenly, the cannon starts going down. They, they you know, cut the ropes so it doesn't pull the oxen and the horses into the hole. And then they have to pull that cannon back up out of the river. I mean, this is, this is hell, you know, and it's freezing. And, you know, these are not Arctic explorers. These are guys that are with just, you know, homespun coats and things like that. So it, this, this is an amazing feat because, you know, not only do they have to cross that frozen lake, but now they're having to cross this river four times. And then, of course, they reach the Berkshire Mountains, which are these frozen, you know, cliffs where they have to haul the 60 tons of artillery, the 120,000 pounds, up these icy mountain slopes and then down again, which was very, very treacherous. And again, they had to do it painstakingly with pulleys and ropes and unhooking the oxen to, you know, pull on the pulleys to bring the sleds up. I mean, it was backbreaking work. How do you get a cannon out if it falls into the river? If you, I mean, the rope is there, but you couldn't use pulleys the same way that you could if it were to fall off of a trail in the forest. So how do they get it out that way? Well, basically they would. They had ropes that they had tied to the cannons. And so then they would string the ropes, you know, attach them to a, an oxen and pull the cannon, you know, either to the surface or drag it to the shore. And uh, then they would use, they wrap the ropes around trees with a pulley system. And then they'd rehook the oxen and they would move it that way. So it was very, you know, these teamsters were using very rudimentary means, but they understood how to move massive loads because they did it for the armies. All right, that's, what, that's where they got a lot of their work because they would move things for the armies. So British and American. So when they came to the cannon, they had experience of doing this. I mean, it seems incredible to us. But they had methods that they would use, you know, and they would put things under the runners of the sleds to slow them down from going downhill, but they would break up, break away. Um, but the amazing thing is, you know, again, they got all their cannons, the ones they would lose to the rivers and, and the lake and on the mountains, they would, they would get them. And, you know, and the whole thing did break down in the Berkshire Mountains, where the Teamsters refused to go any further. They said, forgot it. We're done. This is over. And Knox was looking at disaster. He was looking at, he had all these, you know, cannons stuck in the mountains and George Washington's waiting for him. And so he basically pled with them. He said, you know, this is for the unborn millions. We are involved in something bigger than ourselves right here. This, this, this sacrifice we're making is for the ages. And we have to do this. We have to get through with this. And after three hours of talking, he got them going again. And they, you know, they had to use block and tackle to lower these cannons and pull them up cliffs and things. It's just amazing. And so, but again, this was Knox's magic. Knox's magic was he was a zealot. You know, he believed in the holiness of the American cause. So, you know, these are very religious men in general. But Knox took it to another level where he intertwined the, the noble train with, uh, you know, a godlike quest, a, a holy quest, if you will, that the American Revolution was something holy, you know, and that, not of the earth. And so he was that guy. You know, he was this, again, he was this large man. You know, today we would call him fat. And he, he just... Um, but he was, he was very voluble. He was um, very engaging, charismatic. And so he was the guy to do this. There are other cases in the Revolutionary War where the soldiers are on the brink of breaking down. Valley Forge is the most famous. But there's others like the Quebec campaign of Benedict Arnold where the soldiers are experiencing frostbite. They're marching several miles a day. Where would you rank this on the difficulty scale of that? And were men there also experiencing frostbite or injuries? And what were the challenges that they specifically faced? Yeah, there was incredible frostbite. Um, in fact, uh, Knox had to get a wagon from uh, some people to take some of the frostbite men into the towns. Um, I would say in comparison to, like, you brought up in a Quebec, Quebec campaign, this was 
an impossible task from the beginning. And here's the thing, too. This was absolutely the revolution was riding on this because there was no light at the end of the tunnel at this point. There was only this army falling apart, the British, this overwhelming force, this superpower. And this was, you know, a, a, this was the Hail Mary at the end of the football game to say, let's see if we can do this. And, you know, the British had spies telling them that the Americans were up to something, that they, were, they thought they might be bringing the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga. The British didn't believe them. Basically, the British didn't believe that anybody would try, even try something like this. Because the British are all about protocol. You know, you fight in the fall, you fight in the spring, you fight in the summer, you don't fight in the winter, you meet your force on the open field, you engage in lines where, you know, the first line shoots, the second line shoots. So they weren't used to this army that knew nothing about protocol and would do these things that they thought were crazy. So again, spies were telling them that, you know, they thought that the Americans had gone after the cannons in Fort Ticonderoga. And they just discounted and said, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. And even when they got the cannons and were putting them up on Dorchester Heights, you know, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, they had people telling them, hey, they're putting cannons up on Dorchester Heights. And again, because of the British system of basically, you didn't recognize anybody. It really wasn't of the you know, officer class. So if you had some enlisted man or some spy telling you something, you sort of discounted it. And so this actually ensured that Henry Knox would not be stopped. And he could have been stopped anywhere along the way very easily. And, and so yet, you know, this very Herculean task of pulling these cannons to, you know, Boston under all odds should have failed. But because, because the British would, essentially never recognized the way the Americans fought this war, you know, this would succeed. I'm really interested in how these cannons are able to be brought to Dorchester Heights because it's not just that they're brought there, it's that they're brought there without the British knowing about it. And with all that you've described about the difficulty of moving these one or two ton cannons, how are they able to move them up there in stealth? Great question. So basically, all right, so Washington gets the cannons. And there he has an ability to wage war against the British. But the whole thing is, again, if the British know that they're up to anything, they'll attack. You know, they'll just attack right away. So it has to all be done under the cover of darkness. So they pick a night, you know, March 15th, I think it was the date, and, and they create this incredible ruse where they have Henry Knox start bombing them with some, some of the artillery, you know, just some low-level artillery. So the British, they create a diversion, and they also create noise because what they're going to do is they're going to pull all these artillery, all these cannons, these big 5,000-pound cannons, up to the top of Dorchester Heights in the course of one night. And they do it again with the oxen, you know, and they pull them up. It's a lot like the way they pulled them to Boston. And, you know, they, they have to build fortifications, and they have thousands and thousands of men doing this. And, you know, they do it all in one night. Well, you know, General Howe's sleeping with his latest concubine. The British are just kind of oblivious. And again, you know, there's reports coming in. The rebels, the, the Continental Army, the Patriots, whatever you want to call them, are up to something in, you know, on Dorchester Heights. And so, uh, you know, but again, the British discount this. This is fantastic thinking. This is this is just impossible. Of course you could do this. But all night long they work and they do incredible uh you know feats of building these fortifications and bringing in, you know, all bringing up all the cans and getting them all set up and trained on Boston and in the harbor. So in the morning, dawn breaks and the British are just waking up and Knox unleashes his furious cannonade of just, you know, these shells raining down on Boston and also into the harbor. Uh, General Howe basically wakes up, look, comes out, and he sees 
these cannons up on the high 